Our speaker today is Reverend Tom Nelson. Tom Nelson has served at Denton Bible Church for 35 years. Were you four when you started? <laughs> Much of it is senior pastor. One of four boys, he is from Waco, Texas and grew up playing football and baseball. He holds degrees from the University of North Texas where he quarterbacked and from Dallas Theological Seminary. Tommy is author, teacher of several books and DVDs, and is the Song of Solomon conference speaker emeritus. He is also a featured speaker for several national ministries and serves on the board of several organizations, including his alma mater, Dallas Theological Seminary. Tom married his best friend, Teresa, in 1972, and their two sons, Benjamin and John Clark, are both married and together have given them six grandchildren. Would you join me in welcoming Reverend Tom Nelson today? Thank you. I really am delighted to be here. When I started seminary here in uh, 77, who was not created in 77? Oh, boy. Well, oh, in summer school, this was where our, uh, the summer school was, it was about half this size, and this is where we did uh, chapel. Well, I didn't go into Chafer until uh, graduation. That was the only time I was there. So this was literally where my seminary first memories were when Dr. Roy Zook taught Colossians chapter 1 right here. And so I'm like a uh, salmon. I have returned home to die. All right. <laughs> I'm going to die right here. I'd like you to look at uh, First Kings with me. In chapter 13, I probably don't have um, time to get through all of this chapter, but this is, you will find, a great pivotal chapter in the Old Testament and in all the Bible. And it's not one of those chapters that uh, you find in the golden book of children's stories. It's kind of, uh, there's a little bloodletting taking place. But you just stick with me, and uh, I always think whenever I come to DTS, what, you know, I, I've been, as Mark said, for about almost four decades now in the pastorate, and uh, I always think of what I can share with folks like yourself, that you can stick it back there in your brain, and it'll, it'll come to fruition on you. And so this has got a word here that... Uh, you're going to succeed or fail depending how you respond to it. I don't want to put any pressure on you, but your future is at stake on this text. The context is uh, King Solomon, if you remember, had become guilty of idolatry. And God spoke in judgment and said, I'm going to take 80% of the kingdom away from you. And I'm going to give it to, and God named who the guy would be, a guy named Jeroboam that was his chief uh, industrialist. Uh, so I'm going to give it to him. Pretty bad guy, kind of a Mark Yarbrough kind of fellow. Let me explain that. Just a, <laughs> He was the man under him, all right? He was the man under him, and so God said, Jeroboam, you're going to be the chief engineer, and you're going to be the man, and thus Jeroboam doesn't have to call it a coup. It's not a mutiny. It's an official break that God can do. He's the blessed giver and the blessed taker. And he gave and he, now he takes it away. So he said, Jeroboam, you're going to be the man. And uh, if you remember, Solomon had a kid that brought the house down on himself. His name's Rehoboam. And they came to him and basically said, could you be nicer to us than your capitalistic, materialistic, abusive father was in his reign and be nice to us? And he checked with his buddies and he said, uh, my daddy was tough. I'm going to be tougher. And they said to your tents, O Israel, the Hebrew, that means to heck with you. We're leaving. And so the split came about and Rehoboam went against Jeroboam to get his kingdom back. And God put the curtail on it. And he said, no, this is from me. This is not a mutiny. This has got my hand on it. And so you take your whooping and you take Judah and Benjamin, and you enjoy your little 20%. I'm going to let you have that because of David, and only because of David, because he had created a capital punishment. He had fallen into idolatry. And so Jeroboam has a 
marvelous opportunity, he has been handed a kingdom, and it's a divinely sanctioned dynasty. I mean, the house of Jeroboam, if counselors had gotten with him, they said, look, the, the southern kingdom has gone berserk. You've got to hold us to the knowledge of the true God. You've got a golden opportunity and a bad day to be a great guy. But what uh, he did, there's a term for it in counseling, it's called catastrophizing, where you imagine the worst case scenario. And he thought, if I let my guys up here in the north go down to Judea to worship at the feast, I'm going to lose my kingdom. That obviously God could start something that he couldn't finish. That makes no sense. But that's what he thought. And so what he did was, you remember, he placed idols up in Dan and at Bethel, and he fenced in the northern kingdom. And he created an ersatz Judaism. He called it Yahweh, but he made him into a golden calf here and a golden calf here, and he erected his own priesthood. He erected his own sacrifices. He erected his own pseudo-Mosaic law. Uh, essentially, he did, in a great expansive sense, what Aaron almost did when he said, Behold your God, O Israel. Y'all remember that? Uh, he did that, but on an expansive way. He made his own religion. And what happened was in uh, Second Chronicles, don't worry about looking at it, but here's what happened in his day. It says, The priests and Levites who were in all Israel stood with meaning Rehoboam, from all their districts. And the Levites left their pasture lands and left their property and came to Judah and Jerusalem for Jeroboam and his sons had excluded them. A lot of times when you're going to depart from the word of God, you got to get rid of the guys. It'll be a dissenting voice. And so all of the great guys of the, of the North all bled South. And so he lost his best guys. Are you with me? All right. And so what God does in chapter 13 is what you would expect him to do. God sent a message with no misinterpretation. And he let him know what was going to happen to his house of lies. God was merciful. Let me ask you, if you were God, would your Bible be this thick? It'd be cliff notes, wouldn't it? We would strike quick. But it's a thick Bible because he's a patient God. And so in chapter 13, verse 1, a man of God came from Judah, we don't know his name, to Bethel, the capital of the north, by the word of the Lord, while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. And so he is standing like this little king and priest over this system that he has invented. And he feels pretty safe. He's the head guy. And in verse 2, he cried against the altar. Not against the king, not against the religion. He, he cries against that place that is the heartbeat of the error. The place where the northern kingdom is now going to commune and be reconciled to God. That place of the shedding of blood. God ordained Moriah. Amen? God ordained Jerusalem. God ordained Calvary. That is where I will meet with you, where I say. And so God condemns that altar that he made. And if you'll look at verse 2, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, a couple hundred years later. And on you he shall sacrifice the priest of the high place who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned. The altar is condemned, the king is condemned, the priests are condemned, the worshipers are condemned, and anybody who worshiped, he said, is going to be condemned. He condemned the entire kit and caboodle. And I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but it means everything. He did a big sweep, and he said, this whole thing is an abomination in my sight. Uh, Y'all remember whenever Elisha tells Naaman, go wash in the Jordan and be cleansed? And Naaman said, don't we have better rivers up in Syria? 
You're a dirty little Jordan. That's humiliating to me. And uh, the only problem is God didn't say the Abana or the Farpar. He said the Jordan. And that is the only place that he will give healing. And so you might have a better idea and a better place and a more extravagant place to find salvation. And that's okay, but God didn't say that. Yes, Lord. God didn't talk when I was here. You know, I thought it was kind of the emergent church that you boogie down a little and get back in the Word. You know, okay. I'm willing to try anything. Are you with me? All right. And so, in verse three. This prophet says, I'm going to give you a sign the same day saying, this shall be the sign which the Lord has spoken an altar. The altar shall be split apart and literally the ashes of fat. All of your glorious sacrifices are going to be vomited out. And that is what God thinks about your religion. Uh, Y'all remember whenever they had the golden calf incident? You remember that uh, what Moses did to that calf? He burned it. He ground it. He put it on the water. He made them drink it. You want communion? Drink it. Y'all, it was out of gold. You know what gold is a wonderful thing for in the medical community? It's a great emetic. It'll make you puke like a pet monkey in the Fort Worth Zoo is what it'll make you do. <laughs> And so God sent a sign, and you got regurgitating Jews all over the uh, plateau. And God said, that's what I think about your deity right here. You remember the sons of Korah? They had a rebellion against Judaism right after uh, uh, Sinai. Early numbers, the Jews rebelled against Judaism. They didn't like the idea of a representative guy representing me before God. Do people still have a problem with that? Of one guy being the righteousness of God? And they had a big armed rebellion. And God sent a sign. The earth opened and swallowed them. Always a tip off that God didn't like what you're doing. And then the 250 guys with their false fire pans, fire came down and consumed them. They took the fire pans and they beat them into a plating. They put it on the altar so you would teach your kids. What's the red hot thing burning forever? Well, I'm going to tell you. That's from the men who came to God themselves and without the high priest. And then God took the staffs of all the leaders, laid them down, and their staffs lay dead. And only one staff gave life from the dead, and that was that of Aaron. Are you with me? God sends messages. And so he sent the message, this is what I think about what you think about me. All right, kid protesting over here with me. (laughs) Verse 4. And now when the king heard the saying of the man of God, he cried that he cried against the altar. Jeroboam stretched out his hands from the altar. Quite often, do politicians have a problem with dissenting pastors? Yeah. I want a book, I'll give you a book. <laughs> Pharaoh opposed Moses. What did they say about Egypt? Egypt is ruined. Nebuchadnezzar opposed God. He lost his mind until his reason returned and he worshiped God. Then he got on two legs like a man. He went crazy. Sennacherib lost 180,000 of his army. Then he lost his life. Antiochus was slain without human agency. Alexander was broken off in his youth. Herod, who claimed to be God, the voice of a God, not of a man, and he didn't protest. Remember what happened to him? Worms. Now, that is what happens in the Scripture to men who oppose the living God. And so he stretches out his hand against him. And what happened in verse 4? 
He said, seize him, and his hand, which he stretched out, dried up, and he couldn't draw it back. Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Sennacherib, Antiochus, Alexander, Herod, this guy. No politician will ever stretch his hand against the Almighty and his country come away intact. I'm just glad we're America and we're beyond judgment, aren't y'all? In verse 5. And so the altar was split apart and the ashes of fat were poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God which had given by the word of the Lord. Just like God said, incidentally, there's going to be a day, because I read ahead, all right, in Revelation, there's a place called Babylon that is a picture of the entire confused world. And when you go to chapter 17 and 18, what happens to the harlot? She is destroyed. What happens to the political system in 18? Babylon is through because there is a son of David who brought it to its end. Amen. So I read ahead, we're going to win this thing. Nobody opposes God. And so I think I told you about one time I was in a place working out this gym and a guy says to me, you know, what are you? You're a Christian. Yeah. He said, you know, nice guys finish last. I said, yeah, but bad guys go to hell. <laughs> Always remember that. Watch this. There's not a lot of comeback on that, you know. In verse 6, the king said to the man of God, please entreat the Lord your God for me. Incidentally, Simon the magician said the same thing. Pray that these things won't happen to me. What happens to a government after it stretches out its hand? It gets weak, and then it goes to the believers to please pray for them. I need a prayer committee of you guys. And in verse 6, pray that my hand may be restored. Not that God will have mercy, just pray that he'll fix my system here. And so the man of God, I wouldn't have done it, but the man of God entreated the Lord, just like Moses did, just like Daniel did, just like uh, y'all remember in Egypt, they got greatly blessed because of a Jew that was thought to be dead, but raised from the dead to be the bread of life. And he blessed Egypt and everybody else. And then a king arose that didn't remember Joseph. And he thought the smartest thing he could do was to get rid of the people of God. Can that ever happen to a country to get that insane? Well, instead... Jacob blesses Pharaoh. And so we are a blessing to an idiot country. And so the man entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored and it became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself and I'll give you a reward. Now the orthodox is his best friend. He said, I need to pay you. And frankly, I need you on my staff. Just like when they found out that Daniel could interpret dreams, I need Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. I need all these guys. I want to surround myself with you kind of monotheists. I'm not going to ask for forgiveness, but you guys help me be successful. I'm amazed that this guy is this tolerant for him. But in verse 8, the man of God said, no, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go with you. Nor would I eat bread or drink water in this place because it was commanded me by the word of the Lord. You will eat no bread or drink water or return by the way which you came. No, I am told by God I can have no fellowship with you. I cannot eat with you. I cannot drink with you. Because you're not just a pagan. You're an apostate child of Abraham. And so no, I will not eat with you. And I will not go back by the same way that I came because I will not have anybody else saying that I ate with you. I will avoid every appearance of evil. Ought to be a verse. All right. In fact, it is. I'm not even going to have anybody think that you and I are pals. What fellowship hath light with darkness? Amen. Who was Paul talking to? Be not yoked together with unbelievers. That's not talking about your dating life, incidentally, although that's true. It's talking about embracing false teachers. There are some among you who have no knowledge of God. You're teachers. I say this to your shame, supporting these guys. So he says, you come out from their midst. I don't want to have anything to do with these guys. 
Well, in verse 11, it would be a real nice story if it ended right here, but it doesn't. The story keeps going. In verse 10, he went another way, that a boy, and didn't return by the way which he had come to Bethel. That a boy, he starts off good. Now, an old prophet was living in Bethel. Why is an old prophet there? The faithful had left. An old guy stays there because he's the big fish in the little pond. He's going to aggrandize his relationship with uh, Jeroboam. He's got career aspirations, maybe retirement aspirations. And he is a fleshly man that compromises for career motives. Can guys ever do that in the ministry? Yeah. He compromises the truth because there, is, there are physical accoutrements that he likes. And so his sons came and told him the deeds of the man of God and all that he had done in Bethel and the words which he had spoken. And he realizes, I have opposition there is a man of God here in town, and I don't look good. And what he's got to do is to ingratiate himself to Jeroboam by sinking this guy. Make a note. This prophet didn't have to worry about the hard heathen. It's the compromising guy in the middle he's got to be scared of. That's the guy that can take you down. And so, in verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 12, the father said, which way did he go? And his sons had seen the way the man of God had gone from Judah. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey. And they saddled the donkey, and he rode away on it. He is going to bring this guy down because he cast a light by which he sees himself. How are you going to bring down a prophet that God endorses and backs and will strike you um, lame? How do you do it? Y'all remember a guy named Balaam? He is hired by Balak of Moab to curse Israel, but he can't do it because God won't let him. God keeps turning the curse into a blessing. But he can do this. I can get God to judge him. And so he goes and he takes money from Moab, the Moab king. And he says, here's what we're going to do. I want your women to invite these men to a covered dish. Because they won't fall into idolatry, I don't think, right off. But they are hungry. They've been eating manna for years. But manna bread, manna cotty, every day <laughs> eating manna. And so I want you to go to them with brisket, with some ribs. And let's appeal to their taste buds. And then let's let them know that these are things sacrificed to idols. They've got to be part of idolatry. And one of the boons of idolatry is temple prostitutes. You get to have sex. And they did. It started with just a natural need of hunger. Did Satan try the same thing with Christ? He'll start with a basic need and work back to immorality and you end up where you never thought you could be. And God slew him. And so he recognized, I can't curse these people, but if I can get them to compromise, I'll have God take them out. Can that happen? Yes. Well, this guy takes Balaam's lead. In verse 14, he went after the man of God. Y'all circle that. That's a scary notion. He went after him. Always scares me, Mark, in the book of Job, when God says to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? And Satan says, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. I know his name. I know where he lives. I've got to know his income. And I've got a theory on him. I want to take everything but his wife. You can keep her. <laughs> but I'll take everything else. <laughs> That's a fact. Some things even Satan don't want because that, <laughs> that woman kept saying, curse God and die. That's the kind of person Satan needs. <laughs> well, I'm lost. Where are we? 
Oh, yeah, verse 15, the guy says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, verse 14, he found him sitting under an oak. Why is he under an oak? Because he's tired and he hasn't eaten. He has an immediate physical need of hunger. He said, are you the man of God who came from Judah? He said, I am. Come home with me and eat bread. He knows what the word of God is. He's tempting him. Compromise. I can't return with you, nor go with you, nor eat bread or drink water in this place. A command came to me by the word of the Lord. He quotes scripture. It's like Christ did. You shall eat no bread, nor drink water, nor return by the way which you came. That a boy, stay with him. And verse 18, I'm a prophet like you. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord. What do you call that? That's called a lie. You remember Paul saying, even though we are an angel of God, should preach to you a different gospel, let him be anathema. God does not change his moral commands. Bring him back to your house that he may eat bread, but he lied to him. What should the guy do? He should evaluate the commentary in light of the word of God. That's what. He should evaluate erroneous information by God, not God by erroneous information. But he doesn't. Do you know why he doesn't? Because he needs a theology that fits his morality. Because he's hungry. I need a theology that will allow me to meet my lower drive. And he did it. Can that still happen? Yeah. And so in verse 19, he went back, he ate bread in his house, and he drank water. Verse 20. As they were sitting down at table, the word, as soon as they sat, before he ate a bite, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. It's thus a miraculous thing. It is obviously God overriding this man. God says, no, I'm going to change this guy and his erroneous idea. He said, you're going to eat and drink, but you're not. You're going to get buried. That's the guy who's going to change. I'm not going to change. And so in verse 21, he cried to the man of God who came from Judea. Thus says the Lord, you've disobeyed the command of the Lord, which he observed, and you have not observed the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you. You have returned and eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which you said, eat no bread, drink no water. Your body will not come to the grave of your fathers. Meaning you are not going to die a natural death. You're not going to be buried. You're not going to make it down south. You're about to die in the next few minutes. Whoa. In verse, now what should he do? It, the next verse should say, and behold, the prophet did leap from the table and run like a spotted ape as fast as he could back south, pleading all the way, don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me. Isn't that what it should say? It's what it should say. And you know what? I, I'm not saying this is true. But I'm thinking that God probably would have had mercy on him because God, him, God caught him before he even had an hors d'oeuvre, but he didn't. In verse 23, after he had eaten bread, because that's what your flesh can do. Francis of Assisi called his body brother ass because it always wants to do what it wants to do. Have y'all noticed that your body isn't converted? Not yet. And it still acts in rebellious ways. And so he yields to it. That's the appetites. In verse 23, after he had drunk, he saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he had gone, a lion met him on the way and killed him. And the body was thrown on the road with the donkey standing beside it. Why didn't the lion eat the donkey? Because God told him not to eat. Did y'all catch that? That's real funny. <laughs> One scholar. <laughs> All right. The lion didn't eat the donkey. Because God, it wasn't because this was a hungry lion. This was a mad deity. And so the lion performed the will of God. And God didn't let him eat. The prophet ate. The lion didn't eat. 
because God commanded him. The lion is more obedient than the prophet. And everybody drives by and they see, look, the lion standing, the donkey isn't upset, nobody's eating. This was not an act of violence. This was an act of God. And God sent a message through this prophet. He can preach through you from a pulpit or he can preach through a casket. And God sent a message through this man's death. You need to fear me. Well, in verse 26, it's interesting, incidentally, how many guys are delivered out of the lion's mouth? Daniel, David, Paul, delivered out of the lion's mouth. This guy, the disobedient, is delivered into the lion's mouth. Does this make y'all nervous? It makes me nervous. You know what the big idea of the text is? What does it take to be a northern religious leader? Answer, do you have to come through the tribe of Levi? No, all you got to have is a box top. You can go online and you can be a northern priest. Anybody can be one. What does it take to be a southern prophet? You better walk dead center on God's word or God can take you out in a heartbeat. Amen? Amen. It's a scary thing to stand and say, thus saith God. You better not let somebody compromise you because you need a theology that'll fit your sin. Because God may make an example out of you. Well, in verse 26, the prophet who brought him back in the way heard it and said, it's the man of God who disobeyed the command of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion and torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And now in verse 27, watch this. And he spoke to his son and said, saddle the donkey for me. And he saddled it. And he went and he found the body. It was thrown on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. And the lion had not eaten the body. And the prophet took the body of the man of God and laid it on a donkey and brought it back. Came to the city of the old prophet to mourn and bury him. His conscience is quickened. And in verse 30, he laid his body in his own grave. And mourned over him saying, alas, my brother. You see, that death sent a message to that old prophet. And it's this. If God will slay the true prophet for compromise, how much more will God do to the idolatrous? If God killed this man because he went from a ten to a, to a six then what's God going to do to us who have fallen into idolatry? You remember where Christ said to the weeping nation as he went to his death? He said, weep for yourselves. Weep for your children. And then he said a very cryptic statement. If they do these things in the green tree, what will they do in the dry? Meaning, if death will fall on a green man, a man who is alive and righteous, what's going to happen to you guys that are dead? And so it's interesting, but do y'all remember in Jesus' day, there was a Jewish leader who saw it and he took Jesus' body down. He said, give me that body. And he put him in his own grave and he said, bury me beside him. Who was that leader? Joseph of Arimathea, and he thought, if the wrath of God is so violent as to fall on the innocent, what will God do to our guilty nation? So he said, I don't care whether ever I'm in the Sanhedrin again, you bury me by this man's body, and I will follow him to the death. You know what happened? A couple of hundred years later, Josiah showed up, destroyed the altar, took the priest and sacrificed him and killed him. He took the bones of the common people and then somebody showed him this guy's grave and he stopped and said, leave him be. And so this guy came to faith over the message that was sent about the holiness of God through a compromising man. Well, are there lessons right here? I conclude. Here's what your lessons are. Number one, God doesn't change his word. Amen? God doesn't change his word. 
Why should he? Did he forget something? Is he wrong on something? Can he not perform something? Number two, men do change their word and they do change God's word. Am I right? Men change it all the time. That's why that kid said, yeah, who's that guy in the seminary from Ennis, Ireland? What's his name? He spoke Shane. He made a great statement yesterday. He said, my father had these great commentaries, but he read his Bible all the time because he said by reading his Bible, he could make light of the commentary. <laughs> great statement. <laughs> you evaluate the commentator in light of the Bible, not the Bible in light of some commentator. Number three. In, uh, that's number three. Interpret society in the light of God, not the light of God by society. Another lesson, don't change the Bible to amend your flesh. Another lesson, don't be yoked with unbelievers. They're more dangerous than idolaters or the phonies. Those are the guys you need to fear. I got a lot of pals up in Denton that are in the ministry that are liberals. And I say liberal because they're liberated from the straight and narrow path of God. They like to do their own deal. They're my buddies. I may lift weights with them, but I'm not going to fellowship with these guys that have taken a hard turn at the core issue of the inerrancy of the Bible. I'm not going to compromise that. I've had to be the bad guy for 35 years. I enjoy it. <laughs> Number five, don't change God's word or else. Some pagan he may let live in mercy. You he will not. Number six, any fool can change the word of God. The prophet walks in the light of truth. He does not move. 2 Timothy 2, in a large house, the church, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but those of wood and earthenware, some to honor, some to dishonor. Would y'all agree with that, that in the large place of the visible church, there are pagan guys that are out there? There are wicked vessels. Then you know what Paul says? If a man cleanses himself from these, he'll be a vessel for honor. Context, what's these mean? The bad guys. Bill, we got to turn away from him sometimes. Amen. I will have no part of it. He will be a vessel for honor. You got to stay clean. My hero in the ministry is Charles Hodge. Do you well to read his, his biography. He left for two years to study in Germany because all of this stuff was coming on the criticism of the Bible from an enlightenment rationalistic mind and growing scientific mind. And they had Kant and Hegel and Schleiermacher. And now it's, to, to us, it's old hat. But to these guys, it was new. He went over there and studied. Left early because he found out they were so boring. And he came back home. But when he left to go over there to represent Princeton in the light of what was becoming liberated liberal theology, man plus God. His mentor, Archibald Alexander, said to him before he left, Charles, remember when you land, you breathe poisoned air. Don't you become a statistic. I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, I sat here in 1977 and I heard Roy Zook and I heard Robert Leitner, and I heard Prof. Hendricks, and I heard Frederick Howe, and I heard a bunch of good men, and they put the fear of God in me, and you have not failed me, and you will not. Until the last dying breath, you will be faithful. You will keep what I have entrusted to you until that day. And so now you say to me, you guard the treasure that's been entrusted to you. I hear the words of our Savior, when the Son of Man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? Don't you worry about me. Will I find you as faithful as I have been? I pray, God, for these men and women that they would die old 
and they would die in the stirrups. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.